Revolver Underground. What's going on, guys? It's E-Rock, Revolver Underground, doing a Skype interview with Jamie Alamorand. Did I say that last name right? Alamorand, is that right? Ali Murad. Ali Murad. See, I, hey. that's the hardest part about doing what I do is that I never, I, I always screw the names up. My last name is, is ridiculous, too. So, anyway. Um, but yeah, we are we're here hanging out doing the Skype interview. Uh, first of all, let's let's just jump right into this. Uh, well, well, actually, I'm gonna back up. Are you in New York or LA right now? Where are you at? I'm in I'm in New York right now. I just got back from LA. So are you oh. getting snow? Uh, I had snow. Thank goodness it's melting. So Arizona got our snow now. Weird. So yeah, I don't I don't know what's going on. It's it's bizarre to me. <laughs> Well, uh, that, that's good that you you missed the snow. I get well, didn't necessarily miss it, but don't have it. I now, missed it I coming down. There you so go. There you go. That's that's cool with me. <laughs> Very nice. Well, uh, tell tell me, t- who who is Jamie? What what are you about, man? What's going on? I mean, I would say I put the music first, and I mean that in a very literal way. Actually, when I write, I. 99.9 repeating percent of the time will come up with the music first and that could either be melody or a chord progression or a riff something like that so um, music has has always been a really big part of my life and the first musical memories and thoughts that I have go back to when I was a little kid and I'd be in the car with my parents and they pop in a cassette and I'd be bopping along to the music and I didn't know the words so I'd make up my own words and then I'd learn the words and I'd sing those words <laughs> and it it just began to consume me as I got older and I got really into the arts I cannot draw at all my stick figures look like they're on I don't know what they're on they're, they're <laughs> terrible I cannot draw anything I can draw a good butterfly on a good day like that's about it that's my right. drawing artistic ability but <laughs> with music I felt like I just have this whole arsenal with me and um, I started studying at a young age with my my elementary school music teacher on piano and it was like peeling back layers and layers and layers and there was so much to it and it was just so much fun. So, you know, that side of me, um, I look at it like a giant rainbow. I, you know, I don't know where I want to start, what colors I want to use and um, it's it's a big adventure to try and right. put together a song or an arrangement and when I'm asked to do a cover for an event, it's like, okay, well, I'm going to spice it up a bit and, you know, add a little Jamie to it and it's it's just a really fun gig. I'm so thankful that I, I get to do it. That's awesome. That's And that's what it all comes back to uh, is just having fun with it. You know, I see a lot of the musicians out there that uh, it seems it seems that they they think that um, I don't know they have this attitude about them that they're now that they have gotten just a little bit of fame now that they've gotten this one good show that they're all about you know they just think that they're God's gift to music and yeah it, it's refreshing to see that to hear that you know you just you're doing it because you love it you're doing it because you like it and that's that's really all that matters it doesn't matter about anything else so that's all yeah thank you very yeah. cool um, well how long how long have you been doing uh, what you do doing music how long have you been in the scene i well in the scene um i guess you can really start counting it towards the end of college i formed my first garage band when i was in middle school nice. and i formed it with a bunch of friends and we were uh split between two different schools so i thought that was cool because we had two different markets yeah at that point and we were together i mean we were together technically for four years, but those last two years, we didn't really do much. Right. Uh, in, in middle school, we played the school dances at, at both schools, and we did a couple of town events and community-type things. And uh, it turned into behind the music very quickly. <laughs> um, the, uh, you know, the people that... And I, I, this is going to sound brutal no matter how I describe it, but there, was, there were some people in the band... They probably shouldn't have had an ego because they were kind of new to everything. And right. they were the ones that had the most ego yeah. because we were we were the first band. You know, I was a year older than the rest of the guys. And um, there was no other bands in either school. So we got all the attention. And the more attention that we got, the bigger their heads got. And they didn't want to do any work. We don't need to rehearse anymore. <laughs> Uh, practice on our own 
we'll just do the same songs again. Like, yeah, but we've played them for five months now. They want new songs. Yes. We were doing a lot of covers. There are new hits. We need to do the hits that are popular this month as opposed to five months ago. Exactly. So that was my real intro to what it was like working together with people that weren't in band class or in chorus. Right. That's totally different. Totally. Field. Completely. Yeah. I mean, when there's no teacher there that you're not getting <laughs> on, it turned into a jungle. <laughs> Sometimes. So, would you say that? Would you say that you've had? You've really, from what you're telling me, you've really had like a, a marketing sense uh, from from really early on, actually. I guess so. I didn't really think of it as marketing at that point. I just thought that means we can get more people, right? You know, <laughs> and my my town is my hometown is is like a box. Uh, I feel it's a very kind of cookie cutter world in the suburbs of New York City, where I am. And um, I, I guess it's a general statement that each school, high school, middle school, elementary school, you're kind of your own little universe. So it just felt like when we played one school and then went to the other, it was like going overseas. Right. Oh, my gosh, we get to go and play a new place. And, you know, even though half the band had their foot in the door in one place and we had it in the other place. It just, it felt bigger than it was. And it was large scale for seventh and eighth graders. Yeah. So we felt really cool. And I just cared about filling seats or, you know, the gym floor or whatever it was. And, um, that was my main goal. Um, as far as once I felt we were ready and the music was good enough, I was like, okay, let's get people to hear it. And I guess it just evolved throughout time. Uh, when I got to high school, I started doing theater and I got involved with the, the musical theater program. And whenever it was time to promote, I was the foot soldier out there. You know, like I'll do any interview, I'll do any appearance preview to get people to fill those seats. And it was fun, you yeah. know. Yeah. Uh, it, I it, think it, that's really cool. And that's what, that's what it takes is, is getting, getting out there and you know, moving your brand forward and actually beginning to brand your brand uh, and getting that in people's mouths and that's, and, and, and faces. And, uh, you, you have to do that. I'm, I'm the same with you. I've been in a lot of bands where I'm, I'm the one doing all of the work from top to bottom. Everybody else thinks that, you know, well, um, I play the drums or I play the bass or I play the guitar. Like, <laughs> yeah, but I'm doing everything else. So yeah. I need some help. And that's one of the things, yeah. um, and I've been in a lot of bands too, that have done that right. But for the most part, that's that's one of the things that Revolver is about is teaching bands and artists that you have to become a group. It has it's a group effort. You have to do this collectively, whether you're a solo artist or a, a big band. Um, you know, there's things that you all have to do together, and that's uh, yeah. it's really good that you saw that that early on, and that it's a uh, um, you know something that needs to happen. That's really good. Well, I always thought that when you're in a band, it is like a little community, right? And I thought that you would take people's strengths, whatever it was outside of the music, and that would kind of be your your assignment or the goal that you'd want to reach. And I quickly learned that that sounds good on paper, but in practice, <laughs> that doesn't always work out. Yes. So when I got to college and I formed my first college band, we were together for two years. It started off as an army. We were like Earth, Wind, and Fire, except instead of horns, there were 20 guitar players. Oh you know, gosh. There were just so many people that wanted to be in this band. And we just let everybody in. So it actually started with almost 10 members. Wow. We had like two of everything. It was overly ridiculous. But we all lived on the same floor in the dorm. And we knew this wasn't going to stay that way. So you start with overpopulation. And then the people that are serious, then that becomes yep. the band. Well, it went from 10 to 6 to 5. And then it stayed that way for a while. And then it quickly went to a power trio. And... Um, still throughout all of this, I was doing pretty much all of the work. Right. And we were doing original music. I was the only music major in the band. So everybody was running everything by me and I would do the arrangements. And then it got to a point where when it was just the three of us after two years, they said, well, you know, it's, it's getting time to really buckle down for my major. The courses are starting to get harder. There are more labs. I don't know if I can do this anymore. And I said, that's okay. And that's when I said, wait a minute. I do everything anyway. Since seventh grade and my first band, I've been doing everything. So I'm just going to do it as a solo artist and we'll have 
musicians come in and out and that's what it's been ever since yeah and that seems to be working out pretty well yeah it has and different musicians bring a different sort of flair so it, it changes up certain aspects of the song on stage or in the studio and um you know it leads to a lot of headache and i've certainly had my fair share of headaches sure. but it's it's been a really fun ride so far yeah. and i'm loving it well speaking of a fun ride you you just uh you were just here in la um as we yeah. said before for uh, the the music and artist awards, um, yeah. you were nominated for two awards. The mm -hmm. what was it? The best pop artist and the best rock yeah. artist. Yeah, those two. Wow. How yeah, how was... did how did this all come about? What happened here? The artist and music awards are formed by an LA production group, but they're they're the whole thing is made up of a bunch of different radio stations and promoters and DJs. And uh, I'm very close and have been championed by a radio station called Butterflies Radio, yes. which is based out of Florida. And they have, you know, a home base in Australia as well. And the, the people from that station are so nice. I love all of them. And I finally got to meet them in Los Angeles nice. this time. So that was a huge thrill for me because we've spoken for about two years yeah. and it's just looking at pictures and we've Skyped before and stuff like that. But to actually shake hands and hug is like, oh, this is so cool. That was my favorite part of the awards, honestly. It's just <laughs> <laughs> and they told me last year, they said, you got to put your new album up for it. And I said, OK. So I did. Yes. And um, I, I got selected. And uh, there was uh, an initial nomination round, so they had a bunch of people that were nominated, and then the fans had to vote, and then they would go to judges, I guess. And then it would get narrowed down to five, and in one category I was in, there were six people for the finals. And, uh, I mean, I was thrilled to just get the initial nomination to then get into the finals, because in rock, there were 18 bands, I think, 18 or wow. 19. So you get that down to five, and then in pop, I think there were about 20, and then that got down to six. So that's awesome, and that's all the fans. That's all people voting, so I can't thank everyone enough. And I was getting tons of messages saying that they were voting. They recruited their friends to vote. They voted on their home computer, their laptop. They went to the school computer lab and their job, and they did everything. <laughs> so the support was, was really, really awesome, and they were very vocal. Right. Um, all of the the boards and on Facebook and on Twitter and uh, at one point it was a joke but um, we they got called out um, as a, it was a sarcastic thing but they actually took it pretty seriously and they just went bonkers on Facebook writing to the promoters and the guys behind the awards that when I spoke they're like man your fans are crazy I say yeah <laughs> They they let their voices be heard and they're still doing it. Oh my gosh! It's because you know I I fortunately unfortunately didn't win. I felt like it was just great to be there and I got to see so many people and I I felt I was still very much a, a winner. I didn't take away the hardware. That's not a big deal. Yeah. Uh, but they're pretty upset about it and they're letting everybody know about it, which is is great. I, I really appreciate the sport. They're very respectful. They're not doing anything about bashing anybody. They're just, you know, sad that I didn't get the trophy, but that's they're, okay. They're passionate about you. They're very passionate, and yeah. that's awesome. And this, actually, this is a good interjection. They are so passionate about you. Um, that's really one of the reasons why we're doing this interview right yeah. now. They, yeah. You are the first artist, the first person that I've ever had fans say, you have to do an interview with this person, <laughs> which I was going to do anyway, but they demanded it. Yeah. It was awesome. That, I, I love it. And they're from all over the place, too. I got There's some in Boston. There's some in Vegas. There's some in L.A., Phoenix, New York. I mean, um, uh, Tallahassee, there's you know someone very vocal. So it's, it's very, very uh, like humbling, you yeah. know? You always have gr dreams of grandeur. But then when it actually starts to happen, wait a minute, me? You know, <laughs> so it's, it's very cool. And I see what's going on on there. And I try to stay out of it you know and uh, and just kind of you know because I know I'm not going to get out of control if it does then it's like okay guys you know you got to pay attention to the rules and right. you know, terms and services and all that stuff but I mean just 
seeing the notifications come up all the time is like, yeah, that's so cool. That is cool. Some of them I've had the, the pleasure of meeting in person or at shows and uh, interacting. And, you know, there are others that I, I haven't had yet. And, you know, saying, please come to Chicago or to, to Raleigh or, you know, back to D.C. I've never played in Philly. There's a lot of demand for Philly. So, you know, it's it's great to, to hear all of this. Yeah, it is. And and what's what's the what's the best thing that you remember um, a fan telling? What's the most memorable thing? Thing a fan has said to you or done for you hmm um i get i get a lot it depends on i guess the the demographic i i, I kind of get actually a lot of clusters of comparisons um i would say the the best thing or not the best thing but the nicest thing or the thing that hit me home in the best way ever was one of my idols I, I got to work with over the summer, Gino Vanelli, who yes. I consider the best singer, period, because he can do anything. And then you hear him play, like, who are, you're not human. This person <laughs> is not a human being in what he can do. But I got to study with him, and I, I worked with him. I recorded with him a little bit over the summer. And, and he told me, you know, he looked me dead in the eye, and he pointed, he goes, you're going to go far. You know, that... <laughs> that that meant the most to me to have someone that you've idolized, you know, your whole life, sit with you, work with you, talk with you, and really mean it what he said. And then um, uh, two and a half months later, he was playing in Niagara Falls, and I went up to see him. And we were supposed to do something together. It didn't work out because they actually the they didn't have enough monitors, and um, it would have been hard to hear. There was equipment stuff, but yeah. I mean, we got to hang out a lot and. You know, uh, we spent that whole weekend pretty much together um, when he wasn't doing music stuff. And we just got to talk and he was giving me advice and we were going over what happened over the summer and what we can do going forward. And he was just one of the kindest people I've, I've, I've ever met. And his brother Ross is his manager and um, he's a terrific songwriter and arranger in his own right. And I got to sit with him. And talk with him for many hours, and it was, it was just so much fun. What was the initial? What was the initial response when you found out that you were going to be hanging out with this amazing I was, person? I thought it was a joke. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I I didn't believe it because right. I I've met Gino in the past. I've seen him perform, and he does meet and greets, and I've gotten to meet him. And, and we look alike. We have the same hair, and uh, you know we we look alike. So um, when I submitted to for this opportunity. I got a response very quickly, and it was from Ross. I'm like, uh -huh. Ross, oh, this is a joke, yeah. you know. I, I didn't, I didn't really believe it because it wasn't fancy. There was no letterhead. There were no graphics. And then I wrote back, just saying, "Oh, cool." And then, you know, it's like, "Oh, this is this is legit." He's like, "I'm in. I'm I'm doing this." <laughs> Wants me to go to Portland, and I'm going to do this. That's awesome. And. You know, a couple of months pass, and it's like, oh, yeah, I'm going to do that. You forget about it. But one day, I think about two weeks before I went there, I got a phone call, and it was from an unknown number. The No number came up. And I answered in this very calming, quiet voice. Like, Hello? May I speak Jamie? Like, yeah, this is he. Hi, this is Gino Vanelli. And again, I'm like, <laughs> serious? Like, Gino, it's serious? And then I started listening. Like, yeah, that's definitely him. It was so, it was so cool. And um, I've had pleasure of meeting a lot of my idols and even getting to hang with them briefly. But this is the first time I actually spent quality time yeah. with someone. And, you know, there's that old saying that you should never meet your idols. But this was this was awesome. And um, I, I can't put it into words what it meant to me. But I hope we can do it all again. Yeah. And um, he, he just he really blew my mind uh, in a lot of ways. And he was coming off an injury. He actually, his ears got blown out earlier in the year. Uh, he was in the Netherlands, I believe. And a sound man or one of the crew members did not inform the sound man that he was going to be unplugging something. He had his in-ear oh. And he, <sighs> and he went deaf. He said, it, I think he said for like 10 seconds, he couldn't hear anything. And he, he fell to the ground. He was like KO'd pretty yeah. much. And um, he had been rehabbing ever since and taking herbs and a natural approach to build it. But, you know, he couldn't sing loudly and he couldn't hit high notes and he'd have to play the piano with mutes and he couldn't drum. He'd think he's a drummer by 
you know, his, his default and his original instrument. He couldn't play there. He had to just play pad stuff. And um, he felt trapped. He couldn't travel because being on the plane, his ears would just kill him. And uh, it was, it was mm. a brut brutal time for him. But still hearing him with those limitations, and like, but you're still not singing off at all. There's still all these things that you can do, and you're not even really trying. <laughs> like, what are you? <laughs> Definitely not, not human biggest thing that I took away from that time period as a, as a blanket statement was something that I already felt, but now I felt even stronger about it, was why have a machine do it when you can do it yourself? Like, yes. And then he was showing me all these other things that I could do, which is just singing bla uh, you know, blabber right now. Like, wow. The voice can do that? Okay. So he gave me all these, these things to, to practice. As my phone rings, and um, I, I started putting them into practice immediately because right when I got back from Portland, I was doing a promotional swing in Los Angeles for the new album, and I went right into rehearsing and said, "Okay, remember all those things he told me? Gonna do it, gonna do it." And I made a conscious effort, and of course, you're awkward in the beginning because yeah. you're thinking about it, but it started to become second nature by the end of the week, and I could hear a huge difference in my voice. I wasn't pushing it as hard. I could do more by doing less and still have the same power. It was very cool. Yeah. And then I noticed my speaking voice was getting smoother. Um, I, the fatigue wasn't coming in after singing for three hours. You know, before, after, it, it was, ooh, three hours of singing. Okay, time to rest. Right. To rest, but it wasn't brutal anymore. And um, I just tried a lot of new approaches to things and sometimes it wasn't totally new it was just a different way of looking at it and it made a world of difference and the shows went off without a hitch and i think it's some of the best vocal performances i've ever done in concert it was yeah. great so i'm assuming there's still vocal exercises you do uh you know to practice and to play and to perform you have to yeah. i do i have um a cd or, and I have MP3 files that you know I put in the car, and I'm like, well, I'm going for a drive. Time to sing. <laughs> uh, there are certain songs that I have that uh, from artists that I use as warm ups. Um, there are certain songs that I've written that weren't really meant to be a recording song, but like, okay, this is a warm up song. And the Beatles actually did a lot of that. Um, yeah. One of my favorite, actually, my favorite Beatles song is an exercise. Yes, it is, which was a B side. They just wrote that, and that's how they practice their harmony. Same thing with this boy. That was a, a harmony exercise. Ah. Much the whole song. And then someone heard, I think George Martin heard, so we said, we should get it down. And then they brought it to the, the record label and they said, put it on. And that's how you get those songs. So that's a song that I practice my harmonies to, Those both of those songs. And there are a couple others that, all right, if I want to work on this, I'm going to do this. And right. um, singers unfortunately sound like madmen or women when they warm up so i like to go very far away from everybody because i've i've played bigger shows i, I play once at a theme park and i went in a corner and I, I locked myself in a room and i started doing these exercises where you know you're making weird sounds ah, ooh, and yeah you know all vowel type things all pitches and eventually I had people knocking on the door. <laughs> they said, are, are you okay? <laughs> my, my vocal exercises. Oh, I actually heard people do warm-ups back here. But yeah, I, I unfortunately can't put in headphones and, you know, you can't hear the amplifier and stuff like that. I, I have to let it go. I have to let it rip. And, you know, it starts small and it gets bigger. And eventually it can just sound like a lot of, ah, yeah. you know. <laughs> I just are you okay? <laughs> oh my goodness! Comes to the the vocal warm ups from everybody. Yeah. Rock on. Well, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, a couple singles you have. The first one is what I play on my show. Um, that's what she said. This song. When I first heard this song, um, I said, "I don't care who this guy is. I have to play this song on my show." And I saved it immediately. Now you've been getting some some really good success uh, from this from this single. We're gonna talk about another single here in a second. But what's what's been going on with that's what she said. That's what she said. First off, is exactly what everyone thinks it is. It is a song of that's what she said jokes and double entendre. 
and that's that's what it was. I started writing it when I wrote my first album, actually, and I couldn't get it to where I wanted it to be. Um, it, everything was too corny. I have seven versions, at least, of that song with different lyrics, wow. different keys, and different hooks. I, I just couldn't get it for about two years to where I wanted it to be. And I got it down. Even in the studio, I was changing things. And there were versions where there were slightly different melody lines and the scratch track. Um, I said something else. I'm like, oh, that's actually a good line. I'm going to put that in there. You know, this stuff like that. And I don't know. It just, it just took off. It, it was, it's the second single off the album. And honestly, when it was being mixed and then it was mastered and when I started doing initial promo for it, nobody picked out that song. Everybody went straight to Dancing With You. And oh. for the ballad, they went to Someday Somewhere. You know, all the, you know, experts, if you will, in different media outfits, they went to those songs and they said that was it. There was one review and I, I unfortunately can't think of exactly where it was, but there was one review that said, that's what she said, is what's going to make this album stand out. And two months later, I released it as a single in August, and um, the Indie Music Channel picked it up first, and they're based out in Los Angeles, and they, it got on their top ten radio countdown and debuted at number six. Two weeks later, it went to number one, and it stayed there for six weeks, and it stayed in the top ten for six months. It just dropped out of the top 10 wow. two weeks ago. And be that started the domino effect. And from there, everything was that's what she said. And uh, people have wanted me to do that's what she said, bumps and plugs and promos. And, uh, you know, there there have been a lot of requests for it. But I said, do you, do you want it to be that campy? Like, I'll, it's fine. You know, it's just I don't know what else you really want to do with the song to right. do for that's what she said i mean it kind of just is what it is and the interesting part to me is the response that i've been getting from from europe they've been really digging that tune but most of the people that have been writing to me don't actually know that it's a joke oh They're taking it as that's what oh, she said and that's what she said like oh my gosh and I, <laughs> like i can't believe she said all of that <laughs> I'm I'm not the person to say, oh, you're wrong. I'm not, you know, you can interpret it the way that you want it to as long as you're not going off the deep end. Right. And a lot of people have really taken it as a as a heart-to-heart -heart type of song with a fun, you know, poppy rock twist to it. I'm like, oh, well, that's awesome. That's just another way to approach it, which is something that I had in my mind because I know there is probably an audience out there that doesn't know what that means. So it has to mean something to them as well. So that's been a pretty trippy experience for me because I actually didn't think that audience would be so large. Right. But especially in Belgium and the Netherlands and in Germany, I've I've just been getting a lot of responses of, "Oh my gosh, you know, she said that." What? Because <laughs> most of this this whole album, the whole LP is is true. I I took lines from conversation that I had with whatever girl it was at that you know they're about a couple and uh, some of them from, from text messages and I'm like, well, that's a good line and you know <laughs> it's really life experience yeah. and, um, in some cases that was said to me you know in a song crawling back to me I did have a girl key I love you in my car thinking that that was a romantic gesture she didn't break my TV but <sighs> something at it you know you you put little things on there and um so because of how truthful most of the other songs are this one has a tongue-in-cheek aspect to it you know they're they're not really picking up on that and that that's cool you know but it's been very interesting and what was what's been very fun for me is at shows and um at the Artists and Music Awards, a, a lot of the, the times this happened, I had people that came up to me um, I never met before. They were media outfits and just general admission people that they, they knew who I was and they knew the song. And they'd say something to me. And then whoever else was in the group would be like, that's what she said, right? <laughs> you know, they'd know what 
five guys high five you know and <laughs> it'd, be, it'd be really it'd be really funny i had someone say can i buy you a drink and and then follow that up with that's what she said i'm like well are, are you really gonna buy me the drink yeah. or is it a joke and then they bought me the drink so it was cool <laughs> nice. it was that that song is is really fun. It's really special to me, and um, I'm I'm thrilled that it's it's been such a, a hit on the on the indie scene. It's very cool. Well, it it always has a home here on Revolver Underground, and I know uh, a lot of other stations. You know, Butterflies Radio is one of the stations that airs my show, and I much much like you, I love those guys. They're amazing, and they they really are uh, there to help the the indie artists, and and I love that. That's what's one of the things that attracted me to them. Yeah, thank you for for picking it up and spinning it, and I mean the response has been terrific. Yeah, it has. Now let's talk about your other single, um, uh, "Beautiful." Where, where, what's going on with this one? "Beautiful" just came out. I'm starting to push it as as a single, and I call that the heart and soul of of words left unsaid. There's, you know, I'm a big love song guy. I was raised on love songs. I was raised on the Beatles. You know, I I want to hold your hand. Like, yeah, you know, that's that's what it boils down to. You know, you just you you want that. No matter how cool of a dude you think you are, a bad boy, you really just want to cuddle up with someone later. So beautiful is is very personal. Um, I was seeing this girl, and uh, she went through a very difficult period, and um, it's it's private, so I, I really won't go into what happened. But it was a very bad situation for her, and it, it kind of threw her for a loop. Um, really dark spot in her life and she just felt lost and it's you know it's about outer beauty but it's really more about inner beauty and no matter what happens you know I want to help you pick yourself up and and fly because you deserve to you you have you have the tools I'm just there to try and show you that that you can do it so that's the message of the song and I'm very proud of it and I, I want people to feel that same way because we live in a crazy world. There's a lot going on, especially recently, that is very frightening, and I don't, I don't understand it. I don't really understand the need for violence. I, I don't, I don't really. I'm not a, a huge. You know, I'm not a flower child or anything like that. But I do believe in peace, and I believe you can get a lot further with a smile and a hug than with a punch in the face and a scowl. Agreed. So, um, with beautiful. I really just want people to listen to it and have that same inner smile that I get when I listen to that song. And if you are going through a dark period, that there are people there that feel that way about you and that want to help you and that can bring you back up when you're feeling down. So it's doing pretty well right now. Um, there's going to be a bigger push for it, and we'll see where it goes. And, of course, you know, being released around Valentine's Day is always a nice thing for the romantic side of it. And um, it, it's, it's, it's my favorite song that I've ever written. So what's, what's, what's uh, uh, Words Left Unsaid? What's the, this, is, uh, this is an album, not an EP, right? It's a full length. Full length, okay. Um, and this is, was this out now? Or it's... Came out, it came out in July, late July. July. Okay. Um, and where uh, where can we find that? You can find it uh, for purchase on iTunes, on Amazon. It's there on Rhapsody. All your basic digital uh, retailers have it. Excuse me. Um, there's it's up on SoundCloud to listen to. It's you can listen to it on my Reverb Nation page. My website is being relaunched, so on there you can purchase CDs if you are still into hard copies. I am. I like to hold it. I like to have my collection. Uh, of course, I sell them uh, at shows and everything. And um, that's I think that's basically you know where uh, on Facebook and on Reverb and those music profiles you can buy them directly on there or through a preferred. Outlet, you know, whichever you choose, and uh, you know, Bandcamp has it. All those places. Sure. Well, let's talk a little bit, um, a little bit about where where you where you find your inspiration. What do you what do you look to? Um, it's basically either what I'm going through or what people uh, I'm I'm close to are going to, friends and family. For the most part, I mean, words left unsaid is very autobiographical because that was. That was an extremely high and an extremely low period for me seeing seeing this girl, and as I was digging through those feelings, and you know words left unsaid, these are all things I never told her. Right. I found ah, oh, I have some pent up aggression about some people in my past, so I started writing that, and that's how I got a couple more songs out of it. And so, in you know, that's a very specific case with my first album, lyrically. 
it was a very similar feat. Um, some of them was more of a general song. Um, if it depends on, like, it's all about the story to me. I'm I'm a music first guy, like I said in in the beginning of our chat. So when I listen to songs, I actually don't listen to the lyrics that much. I know that might be a shock and awe thing to a lot of people. I'm more into the production and the inner complexities of the music, or how'd you get that sound, stuff like that. The arrangement. Yeah, yeah I'm, re on. I'm really, really into that and how it was recorded and where it was done and like, oh man, that's a frying pan. How'd you get it to sound like a gong? You know, stuff like that. And um, so, as I, I like poetry at the same time. I'm a big fan of of Walter Whitman and um, you know uh, Longfellow and uh, lots of the the classic poets. And um, there's. There are a lot of gems. Some some of it is like that's that's poetry. I don't really get that, but I find inspiration in little lines. Um, sometimes, even just watching TV, there's an episode of something that there was a small event, maybe not even the big factor of the show, but that really struck a chord with me, and that actually relates to my friend who's going through this, or in school this just happened, or you know actually that sounds like me, and I I put it put it to song and I I used to when I was younger I used to force it I used to go for well that's what they want and then I do it and then it wasn't it wasn't such a hit with the crowd like eh, you get the reaction and there was a song that I was very shy about because it was about me well no one's gonna care because it's about me and then I do that and afterwards we're like man I was feeling that song like really but that's about this one situation. How can that pertain to you? So as I started to write more and get more experience, I realized, oh, well, if I'm going through it, there's probably someone else that's going through it. And you can't just force feed everything. And um, it's, it's, it's just led to, it's led to what I have out so far. That's, that's awesome. That's a, that's a really good outlook on, on the way to, the way to look at it. People, People love, especially being an artist, people love to know about you. Um, and you can see that with your own Facebook page, you know, that you have. People love to just get into what you're doing and all this stuff. And that's that's what it's about is is to touch someone else, uh, to, you know, bring your life into their life. And uh, that's one of the, the really good things about being a musician is you have the opportunity to do that. Yeah, absolutely. I'm a big fan of, of Yes, the band. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I love them really uh, in the 80s. There's... There's something special to me when you can go commercial but still have a lot of complexity in your music. So that's what Trevor Rabin brought to them, who's one of my favorite guitar players. And he sings like a beast, too. And now he writes for every movie ever yeah. made. It's a lot of great stuff. Uh, I was watching, when I was in middle school, um, a documentary on them. I think it was called Yes Years. And he brought up something that has hit home with me and has stayed there. So there are two ways to write a song, your way and the wrong way. And the people that try and craft you and show you things and ideas and teach you how to write a song, all they can do is bring their experience to you. There's no formula, mathematical way to write a song. You kind of have to feel it out. And that's going to lead to a lot of, all right, crumble up the paper, let's do it again. But sometimes in that crumpled up paper, there's an idea and you cut that out and then you find another crumpled up paper and there's another idea and it's like putting together a puzzle. It doesn't always flow. So I think that's a, that's a trap that a lot of beginning songwriters fall into like, oh man, you know, Paul wrote yesterday because he woke up from a dream. Well, it took him two years to finish yesterday. The original name of it was eggs oh my lady how i love your legs I, you know yesterday all my troubles seemed so far away it sounds a lot better to me but that's what he came up with and everything else was da 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 da, -da. and then eventually he found the words it, you know not everything sticking with the beatles can be like help where john went into the bathroom and in 10 minutes bam there's help you know yep. but he was feeling at that time so he was just a plea for help, and it just happened to go to the song. You know, so there, there are different ways to approach it, but you'll get frustrated. It's natural, but you should never let that pile of crumpled paper or pressing the delete button a million times really deter you from writing your song. Just let your voice be heard. Absolutely. I agree with that 100%. I have a couple more questions for you, and then we're going to wrap this up. But the, the first question is, has there ever been a time in your life where you have thought – 
I, I don't know if this music thing was such a good idea. Has there ever been a time? Oh, yeah, when when the paychecks don't come in. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's very daunting. This is, this is the hardest career. My friends don't get it. A lot of people don't get it. They think that if you're a musician, you're a slacker, you're a quitter, you have no drive, and you don't want to work. Tell you something that is the exact opposite if you're going for a nine to five job you have it way easier than what we have it because you go to school you get your degree and you prepare your resume if you're qualified you're gonna get that job I have a music degree I have a bunch of awards I've sold thousands of downloads and CDs I don't have record companies banging on my door saying hey, we want to give you a job. We want to sign you and promote you and do all that stuff. And even when I'm banging on their doors, they're like, who do you know? Do you know these people? No. Door slams yep. in your face. So I know, I'm out. I've done this. I've done the, the old school approach when I played on the Sunset Strip. I've done exactly what Guns N' Roses did and stand on the street corner and find people and say, hey, I'm playing at this venue in three days. Would you like tickets? And most people just walk by, but you got to do it. And in today's industry, you're your own manager. You're your own booking agent. You're your own promoter. Fortunately for me, I've started to assemble a team, so I'm not wearing all the hats anymore. But I'm still overseeing everything. I have to approve everything. And I'm on this computer pretty much all day. Yeah. And when I can get a moment to breathe... I like to go outside, not right now because it's freezing. <laughs> you know, I I unwind to video games. I need that's that's my way to escape. Give me Mario, give me Sonic. I'm gonna go play, and that's that's how I relax. And sometimes that even draws inspiration because their worlds are so wacky. Like, oh, that's really cool. I'm gonna go write that down. And um, so it's it's frustrating. There's a, there's a meme going around that sums it up perfectly with, with the way the music industry is and how people are, as a consumer, are viewing music. You'll pay five bucks for a little cup of coffee that doesn't take much time to make, doesn't take much money to make, and you sip it, you throw it away, it's done. That, mm. But you don't want to spend 99 cents to download a single that is yours, and you can put it on whatever that you want and it's yours forever you got it you own it and we put our hearts soul time blood sweat and tears everything into it and you just want it handed to you for free i don't really i don't really understand that it's one thing if that's not your cup of tea as far as the music goes and you don't want to get it that's cool but i know a lot of people that i love this band or i love this dj even but they just want to download it all for free. Like, well, what about all the effort they put into that? And I don't, I don't think that's, that's really fair. And it, it's definitely not. And I think that, you know, that's one of the problems with, well, <laughs> one of the many problems with the music industry today. Um, that's going to be our next Skype talk. But, you know, <laughs> you know there are, I don't know. I, it, it's just, it's craziness. I don't understand why, uh, with you, why it's, it's such a big deal to buy I'm not going to buy a whole album. I, I just, I, these days, I just, it just seems weird for me to buy a whole album. And if, if I don't like it, I can, yeah. I have the option to buy 99 cent download. I can do that now. If I yeah. like the entire album, I'll buy it. Yeah. But 99, like you just said, it's a cup of coffee. If you're going to Starbucks every day, you're spending at least $4 on a cup of coffee. I mean, if you really wanted to, you could go into a city, look down for three hours, and you can find 99 cents on the ground and just say, okay, cool. That's my song, and and you know it's, it's ninety nine cents. You're not exactly. buying the deluxe limited edition vinyl plus CD plus digital download for one hundred fifty dollars. Yeah, that's for the super fan that wants the collection. Right, ninety nine cents if you want a song, and you're still pirating it. It's ninety nine cents. Yep. Me, I can go without the smoothie that day. That's six dollars at whatever place and get four songs and now i have these four songs that i can take when i go for a walk when i'm chilling at home i can crank it in my car stereo i can do whatever i want with it and songs for me kind of act like a yearbook there are moments in time that are just frozen because of that song 
And that means a lot to me. I know I'm a pretty sentimental person when it comes to stuff like that, but man, I, I can't think of many cups of tea or frappuccinos like, man, that frappuccino that I had in whatever store, like, that was a really good frappuccino. Yeah, that was a good day. I, I can go, really. Yeah. Unless you're sharing it with someone that means a lot to you or, you know, you star-crossed lovers met while you were having that frappuccino. Right. That's a different thing. But, you know, that's that's Hollywood stuff. That's made-for-TV things. It's not very realistic, to Absolutely. be honest. Absolutely. Well, let's, uh, let's go down the touring side of things. Uh, you, you have toured, but is there any, any tours coming up? We're working on a lot of stuff. I just got new booking people, and they're sending out stuff. The problem when it comes to booking is availability. There, there starts to uh, become a snowball effect, like, okay, we're getting offers, we're getting things. But then it's mapping it out. And there are a lot of new markets that I'd like to get to. I've mentioned some earlier, especially on the East Coast in Philly. There's a demand now to go down to North Carolina and Chapel Hill. There's a big demand in Orlando and Florida. I've never played these places. I would really like to get there, but it has to make sense. And a lot of times it goes, I'm just going, I'm throwing out arbitrary dates. They want April 10th. But someone else wants April 10th. So now you have to do, unfortunately, a little bit of a bidding war and you have to say, okay, well, this one's going to make more sense at this time for all of these reasons. And that that's the tough part. Yeah. So working on a bunch of spring dates, um, I can tell you in the works are Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Washington, D.C. Those are four major markets we're looking at. Um, Smaller markets, there's talk for Providence and Worcester. Um, we're trying to get a, a hometown show where, where I'm from in Westchester County. Um, there's talks of either in Port Chester and White Plains that could be happening. Um, and we're trying to figure some stuff out for Chapel Hill. We've been talking for a year now about Orlando and Miami. So we're trying to see what's going on there. And then I believe in what depends... But there, there could be some cool stuff coming for LA in April again. Yay. Maybe in June too. There's so there's nothing there's nothing in stone. Right. That's what we're trying for. And I, I, I didn't get a chance to play in Portland when I worked with Gino, but there are a lot of venues that I've been speaking with. I'd like to get that going there. I'd like to play again in Vegas. Um, you know, I get down into to, to Phoenix again, and um, I, I would love to do something in Austin and uh, the middle of the country. I've never played. I've never played Chicago. Um, I've, I've never played, you know, St. Louis and Kansas City. And um, I have a good following in Tennessee. I'd like to get to Memphis and to Nashville. I just moved from Nashville, actually. How, how'd you like it there? I I just moved from Nashville, actually. Yeah, I <laughs> Is it is it very country? Uh, I... Well, you know it is. It is country. Um, obviously, it's it's you know it's the headquarters of country music. But yeah. but you can go um, it, pretty much any night of the week and find whatever type of music you want. Broadway, however, the the main drag through Nashville, you're it's going to be country saturated. I think there's like one bar that has you know dance music on it. But you you actually can you can find any type of music that you want. And it it actually rock music is doing really well there. Ironically, it, rocks become. Rock and country have kind of become married. Yeah. There's so many things that I hear and they say, oh, that's country. I'm like, no, that's not country. Yeah. <laughs> that's not country at all. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. Do they still consider Taylor Swift a country artist? Is that is that? It depends on who you talk to. Come on, people. Yeah. Come on. She's not a country artist. No. I didn't know her. Even, even before she wasn't really, but that's, I mean. That's it, exactly. Exactly. Come on. Yeah. That's as pop central as you can get. So. Yes, very much. <laughs> there and you know check it out and see what's going on yeah you should you really should um i spent about four years there and uh, that's actually where i launched revolver underground and i don't i don't see anywhere else i could have done that um i, I could have been here in la but i just don't see it i don't see it being where it it just seemed l right to do it in nashville and i'm glad that i did so um but yeah man you got to get there you got to go and you got to check it out at least uh just to visit but um uh, yeah it, it's a pretty good place friends down there so I, w I would love to to check it out i mean pictures always look great i've had friends that have gone to visit other friends down there and it's like oh you gotta go i was like i just i haven't had time and we haven't had any 
offers to get down there to play, you know. So, but now it's starting to roll in. So, you know, we'll hopefully we'll hopefully get down there soon. That'd be really great. Yeah, that would be actually that'd be uh, that'd be awesome. We'll we'll talk a little bit off uh, off camera about that too. Uh, Jimmy, thank you so much for hanging out. Really appreciate it. For one, having one more time, tell everybody where uh, to find your music. Sure. If you if you Google me, there's gonna be lots of things coming up. If you, I'll give it's uh, Jamie Alimarad, J A M I E, and the last name is A L I M O R A D. We're relaunching the website. That's JamieAlimarad.com. On Facebook, type my name in. Twitter, Reverb Nation. Um, I'm listed under uh, Boston. If you're looking under cities, Boston Pop and Rock. Um, what else is there? You know, I still have a MySpace. They did a MySpace. So now I'm on new MySpace too. I don't really understand new MySpace. It looks very cool, but I don't really get. I'm not. I'm not pimped out on there yet. So yeah. if you're a new MySpace expert, help me out because <laughs> I actually really want to be a part of it. But I don't know what I'm doing, and I'm trying to post stuff. And you know, I I have a, a web guy and. He's new to it too. He didn't even know there was a new MySpace. Like, yeah, it's still in its beta form, I think. But so we're working on that. Um, what else is there? You know, SoundCloud. You can find me. Just all you gotta do is type in my name on SoundCloud. Though I think it's Jamie Dot Ali Murad. I think that's the only difference. But and of course, the, the singles and the EP and the LP are available on iTunes, Amazon, MP3 store, Rhapsody, E Music. Um, uh, where else is there? The, um, Bandcamp. All your favorite spots. Good lord, that's a lot. They're all there, yeah, they're all there. Wow. Words left unsaid. The new album out now. Go find it. It's gonna be good. I enjoy it. Um, I, you. That's that's what I that's that's how I do it. I, I like music I can drive to. I've been getting a lot of good feedback that way. Feel good music, especially we're getting out of this dredge of winter. Ugh. It's, it's gonna be good. Good springtime. Even L.A. L.A. was cold. It was. It was I'm, I, I was, had to wear a coat. Yeah, I was. I mean, I can't complain because I came from single digits, literally, right. to sixty degrees. But then when it started getting into fifty again, you know, first world problems. Ah, <laughs> uh, oh man, I just wanted it to be warmer. I I, I went to the beach. And I'm like, ah, I'm in a coat. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I was 80 the week after I left and I went to Vegas for a while it, it went back to 80 and like oh come on and yeah. Vegas was like really damn it so, well, well we'll get you back out here it'll be warm oh yeah I can't wait I'll be there soon rock and yeah. roll rock and roll Jamie thanks so much I do appreciate it guys go check him out um, it, it, lots of good stuff man lots of good stuff find him in your town he's coming to your town if uh, you know if you want him to come to your town and he doesn't see it go request it go find somebody go get them here go and, tell them and it. I'm on demand it yeah. there it is do that perfect i love it right there all right guys that's it right there thanks so much i'm e-rock peace revolver underground